just so, to get an idea of who's here, uh, how many of you are meat eaters? Is that an impolite question in this crowd? Or you're too scared to say, should right? We all, should we put our heads down Burn and raise our hands <laughs> if we're meat eaters? All right, everyone put your heads down. Put your heads down and raise no, your hands if you eat fish or chicken or steak or anything. It's okay, you know. Okay, so, so, okay. Great, we know who to get We'll afterwards. be having a pogrom later. Um, but Gene, you've been a vegan for 20 years? No, since 1985, so it's getting close to 30, actually. 30, I have told, wow. And you've been a vegan? For 27 years. Wow. I have been a vegan for 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making no promises about tomorrow. Uh, it's been a rough 24 hours. I, I made a cappuccino and I realized I needed almond milk and I ran to the store and then I realized I was hurting the environment. You guys deal with a lot of issues. I'm very impressed with the emotional landscape that you run every day. Which m makes, this is, uh, who gets to sit up there? It's like the Nuremberg trials up there. <laughs> I think they're judging us. So how, it, which makes me think, how have things changed throughout this long time you've been a vegan as far as, as the way society judges you? Because you get hostility. In a world where eating animals is the norm. And so we're saying and challenging this notion that animals are there for us to eat. And as vegans, you know, eating plants instead of animals, we are, in many cases, causing people to reflect on their own behavior. And I think sometimes people, um, you know, would rather not deal with scary, challenging, painful realities like the factory farming industry and the fact that by buying and consuming animal foods, people are, in a sense, supporting an industry that is horrible. And, and, and most people are humane. So there's this disconnect between humanity and compassion and behavior and 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 sometimes people don't want to look at it and i think vegans sort of draw a light to it and historically it's been uh, i think there's more recognition about the cruelty and more s general support for it uh, but still people i think feel somewhat conflicted but, so the argument there is that people are hostile towards vegans because they have some guilt deep down i think that's so. a good question why are people hostile towards vegans? I mean, I have this question hostile. like, but then why are people hostile towards Jews? Yeah. Why well, are people money like, grubbing. But like, <laughs> half my family's half my family's Jewish, and like, I've always or like, why are people hostile towards gays? Like, what business is it of anyone else? Like, why does it matter? Like, why do these, why do things provoke this hostility? And I'm, and I'm not even asking this rhetorically. Like, I'm genuinely confused. Why are people angry at vegans? I mean, I understand, like, we all go through this trajectory. Like, when you first become a vegan, you're a dick. You know, like, you're, like, throwing blood at stores and you're yelling at people. Like, when I first became a vegan, I'm not kidding. I took a vow of silence where I would only talk to other vegans. That's, like, <laughs> and then I realized. Wait, wait, how long did that last for? Like a day. <laughs> um, did you, did you inform people why you weren't talking to them? Or? <laughs> but, so you go through this trajectory and eventually you realize, like, if one of your goals is ostensibly to make the world a better place, then your activism has to be practical and effective. And, like, throwing blood and screaming at people tends to just piss them off. You know, like, it doesn't necessarily advance the cause, well, it just makes people angry and makes them almost, like, more entrenched in their beliefs. Well, we're... We're getting a couple reasons people hate vegans. One is guilt. Another is they may be- dicks. Yeah, it was stridency, right? People don't like uh, people being judgmental. But you also hit upon like tribalism. Like it's just someone who's not in your tribe and doing something different. And I'm, because I've been both. Like when I was in high school, I was the quintessential, if that's the right use of that word, meat eater. Like. Burger King, Chi Chi's, McDonald's, and there was one vegan in our high school, and I ridiculed her because she wouldn't wear a, use a leather mitt for softball. And I was like, little punk rock meat eating me. I was like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Then fast forward a couple of years, and I'm way more militant a vegan than she was. 
But these, these are emotional issues. Food is an emotional issue, and there's identity involved with it, you know? And, and people don't want to be told that they're, they're mean. And a lot of times, vegans have kind of been judgmental. And that has, I think, set our cause back. And I think, as vegans, we've somewhat evolved and grown ourselves, and are more respectful and understanding that change takes time. And I think that's one of the reasons that the movement is really starting to grow. And you have also some really influential folks that are speaking about the benefits of plant-based eating. And, um, you know, Al Gore, for example, you know, is, you know, for, you know, you had a conversation with him, right, about an inconvenient truth. I, about 10 years ago, um, and I want to make it sound way more personal than it was, I want to say, well, like, Al and I were having coffee. No, we're hanging out, right? Um, I was at an event, and he was there, and he was taking questions, and I said, Mr. Vice President Al Gore, Oscar winner, Nobel Prize laureate, um, because that's how you have to address him. <laughs> and I said, why, in An Inconvenient Truth, the book and the movie, did you not mention animal production when, according to the United Nations, animal production contributes more to climate change than every car, bus, boat, truck, plane, etc. combined? And his answer was so sincere. Like, I expected him to be a mealy-mouthed politician and either be, like, defensive or dismissive. And he actually said, he said, you know, veganism and the role of animals in climate change is too inconvenient of a truth for most people. And I thought that was like, wow, kudos to you for actually having a conscience and a soul, unlike every other politician on the planet. And so has he made that part of his message now? I, th I, th I mean, he became a vegan. Or, I mean, I think there's this, like, new subset of vegans, like we'll call them like the Bill Clinton vegans. The cheap like, vegans, really, right? Like, like the 98% <laughs> vegan? vegans, like vegan unless you happen to be somewhere where they're serving meat that you like. Oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so that's, that's what they do. They're vegans, vegans, it's like being kosher at home or something. Yeah, let's call them like VOCs, like vegans of convenience. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think they have the aspiration, they yeah. think it makes sense, but in practice they are less stringent, you know, than their ideals would in, encourage them to be. So there's this disconnect between the ideal and the real behavior. And I think with everybody, none of us is perfect. Even the most vegan <clears> vegan <throat> is not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all works in progress, basically, you know? And, and so I think early on with us vegans, you know, we thought we were pretty special and we kind of, we still kind of do a little bit, but you know, it's, the fact is, you know, all of us are just trying to do better and trying to live well and trying not to cause harm, ultimately. And, and if we can live well without causing harm, why wouldn't we? And, you know, so, and that's sort of the question vegans sort of raise. And then if people yeah. are causing harm, they think, ugh, you know, they don't like it, you know, and feel badly, I think. And I think for vegans, a lot, or animal rights activists, there's this sort of, the subtext is that we are just and for, maybe you agree with me or not, but like we're baffled by the fact that everyone doesn't agree with us. Because if you have like scales here, like over here you have climate change, rainforest deforestation, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, animal suffering, water pollution, zoonotic disease, etc. on this side, and over here, someone saying they like bacon. Like, and it's, we're like, do you not like, how is it that no one else seems to see this preponderance of evidence over here in support of at least a way of life that's not so dependent on animal products? And the sole justification is, well, I, I like to eat bacon. It's like, and then I almost want to say to people like, fine, but why should we take care of you when you get sick? Like, you know you're killing yourself, you know? Like, Kind of like cigarette smokers. It's like, God bless, go smoke cigarettes. But really, you want health care to support you? Like, well, my tax dollars? I'm, if I become a libertarian, like I'm a, little a bit, vegan. A little bit. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to that because you can yell at me in a minute. But uh, as far as the, the movement having a little less stridency than it did in its infancy, um, how do you make a decision about when to be strident and when to be accepting of people who don't agree with you. I mean, at some point, it's your beliefs, but at another point, it's not effective to be a dick. So how do you make that decision? I think it's case-by-case -case basis, and I think that you need to speak to people where they are on their own path. And that's one of Farm Sanctuary's organizational values that I think is very important, is recognizing that people 
oftentimes change incrementally and learn about one thing and say, I don't like that veal and I'm not gonna do that anymore. And then they learn about another thing. And then each time a little step is taken, it sort of builds momentum and creates a movement ultimately. And, and I think that you know, if it's all or nothing that we're asking for, we're usually gonna get nothing. And so it's just about being effective. And it's more important to be effective than to be right. And, but when you talk about tolerance and intolerance, it's a challenging reality, because you know, what is happening is horrible, and to be able to allow it and accept it is ethically unacceptable, but you don't have a choice, because it's going on and horrible things are happening. But you can recognize you can't do in everything, and, and you also, it's a serenity prayer. You know, the, the strength to change the things you can, the serenity to accept things you can't change, and the wisdom to know the difference. And, and was that the attitude you think of previous social movements? Uh, I think whether... they're all complex. You know, I think in each movement, right, there's, there's the hardliners, and then there's the more uh, sort of compromising groups. And, and the challenge, and the, what we try to do is to be idealistic in terms of our hopes and aspirations, a vegan world. But realistic in terms of steps people can take in the direction of that ideal. And, you know, we think it's easy to stop bad, you know, speak about bad things and what's wrong with them. And there's a lot of horrible things in the world, factory farming being really the center of so many of them. But then you need to create solutions and, and, and options that work. And that is a bit more of a challenge. You know, like what would a vegan world look like? You know, if you think about it, what exactly would that look like? And, so these are, we're in a process, and I think the stridency movements, you know, sometimes stridency helps. So I think there's a real variety of voices, and that's helpful. And, and luckily, we were sort of talking about this yesterday, as time has passed, there have become so many interesting, ostensibly disparate ways to advance the agenda. You know, like you meet someone, and you become like this vegan ninja, and you figure out like, okay, should I appeal to their ethics? Should I appeal to their love of animals? Should I appeal to their health? Should I appeal to their environmentalism? And sort of, I think what we're all trying to do is like push forward the thin end of a lot of big wedges, you know? So like you, you find someone who sees a video on YouTube of animals being nice to each other, and rather than say like, you know, fuck you, that means you should be a vegan, you say, oh, look at that, you like animals, huh? How about that, that's great and you sow these little seeds, you know. You were saying that you think when this is all said and done and the movement succeeds, that YouTube videos will have been a very powerful tool. I think so, yeah. Because how many people here have, in the last couple of days, watched a video on YouTube involving animals doing something great? Like, everyone. <laughs> and that's happening for everybody, and if I was to sound like a Southern California hippie, which I kind of am, it's like it's opening our heart chakras. And like suddenly like people's like sphere of compassion is expanded. And so you have someone who's eating meat in front of their computer, looking at like animals doing wonderful things, having this profound emotional response. And maybe at some point they start looking at the food they're eating and they connect the two. I mean, that's what happened with me. I had adopted a cat and when I was 19 oops, or 20 years old, I suddenly looked at this cat and I thought, wow, I would do anything to keep this cat from suffering. His name was Tucker. And all of a sudden, the synapse is connected and I thought, okay, if I don't want Tucker to suffer, why am I involved in processes that contribute to the suffering of other creatures who have two eyes, legs, central nervous systems, and then I just, that was the start of it for me. And you were saying another way in, because we are inherently selfish beings, is, is health. Because it's like the environmental movement has found that, that telling people about global warming not very effective in getting them to buy certain products, but telling them keeping these chemicals away from your children is a great way to sell household products that are ecologically friendly. Yeah, it's very relevant if you're suffering from heart disease and, ha and, and, and you know, we could save something like 70% of healthcare costs in this country by shifting to a whole foods plant-based diet. So I think the health issues are really starting to resonate and I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people are shifting not necessarily to becoming completely vegans but certainly eating fewer animal foods. How many folks here have seen the movie Forks Over Knives? Is that a fair number? So that's, that has I think played a very important role in making the case 
that we can live well without eating other animals. You know, we grow up with this belief that you need meat for protein. And without meat, you're going to, you know, become weak and not survive. Or you need to drink cow's milk for calcium. You know, but in our country, we drink a lot of cow's milk and we still get a lot of osteoporosis. So if right. drinking cow's milk was a solution, that would be. So these are myths we grow up with and beliefs we grow up with. And um, I think they're starting to be dispelled. And if you have a choice to not eat animal foods, then it becomes actually a little bit more challenging. You know, because if you have a choice and you choose to do the harmful thing, um, then you know, that's something that can be, feel not so good. And, and what about the argument that some people will have who might be on stage, that you people, uh, you people, <laughs> that's right, uh, care. It'd be more effective if you wagged your finger at us. <laughs> Church lady style. The, the, you care less about food. You're just less interested in food, and so it's an easier sacrifice for you guys to make. So They like this argument. Here, this was, I'm gonna wag my finger. I have a friend in New York, um, and he works for Fox News. Um, he's actually a Democrat, which is odd. Um, but, so he works, I just like to say, works for Fox News, and he is a hardcore meat eater. And for years, he's ridiculed my veganism. And his, he's, been, he's like, but it just tastes terrible. And so finally, I got tired of this, and I said, okay, I'll give you a challenge. Month. I will only eat vegan food. That's easy for me because I'm a vegan. And I said, and you only eat animal products. And he was like, fine. I was like, okay, that means no salt, no pepper, no onions, no garlic, no bread, no tomatoes, no citrus. And he got so upset. I was like, you, can eat, you can't eat bacon because bacon has spices in it. You can't eat sausage because that has spices in it. So when people say vegan food doesn't taste good, it's actually what makes animal food taste good usually. No, 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 I'm sorry, that's not what I was saying. Um, <laughs> oh, I thought you were, I, 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 I would. Because you said we don't care about food, and like, when I was uh, growing up in Connecticut eating meat, that's when I didn't care about food. I was just like shoveling quarter pounders into my face. Becoming a vegan has actually made me fall in love with food. All right, so how frustrating is it to, to have me on stage who, uh, completely agrees with you guys, and yet continues to eat meat. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of people, I think, <laughs> really see the arguments. It makes sense, Total sense. rationally. Yeah. And then the behavior doesn't line up, right? So, how, I, I mean, that is the thing that, you know, is kind of uh, confusing, you know? I mean, we're imperfect, so there are, that's the reality, but we can do better. And if we know we can do better, why don't we? Uh, I mean, that's the way our world is, and that is something that we grapple with. And so, you, what do you think about it? <laughs> it's weird. Um, a lot of it is, a lot of morality isn't that internal, and it's kind of what everyone around you does and finds acceptable, so there's not a lot of pressure to do it. Uh, a lot of it's laziness, a lot of it's moral imperfection in general and accepting that about myself. But but I wonder um, what, what can be, are those people more frustrating than the people who just disagree with you? Are there a lot of us? I think most people are starting, you know, there's this widespread opposition to factory farming, saying it's wrong. Anthony Bourdain, who's certainly not an animal rights guy, says what happens on factory farms borders on the criminal. And you, know, have, you have folks like Charles Krauthammer, you know, a, a conservative commentator, who was asked by Politico, what will we look back on in 100 years and, ask, and look at and say, it was unbelievable we did that horrible thing. And he said, eating animals. I thought you were gonna say vote Republican. <laughs> <laughs> so you have this, this kind of acknowledgement. <laughs> I, I don't know about, <laughs> we have all kinds in our movement, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, you have, yeah, these moral dilemmas and some of them are much more clear and convenience has, has I think actually been an issue you know if, and, and you mentioned how everybody's doing a certain thing it becomes the norm but if you look historically at humans what we have done and has been the norm has been unbelievably horrible and also things change really quickly really like, quickly so where's we were, the moment like if we were having this conversation a hundred years ago kids would be working in factories right 
Italian Americans and Irish Americans couldn't even like hold elected office in most places in the United States. Women couldn't vote. Um, African Americans couldn't use the same drinking water fountain. So I mean, like, a change happens. Change happens quickly, and I mean, think about gays in the military. There was a decade yeah. of talk about what was going to happen, and then it happened, and no one said a word. Like, so where is that, is it frustrating for you guys that that moment hasn't happened? It's happening for marijuana, it's happening for gay marriage. I, I feel like it's, and this is an obscure analogy, it's like the ice sheets. Like they'll be looking at images of a huge ice sheet somewhere in Antarctica. And they'll be like, oh, it's stable, it's stable. Oh, it's gone. Like all of a sudden, like all these little contributing variables that you might not even be aware of, the cumulative effect of them makes incredible change happens very quickly. And I feel like with our movement, it's the fact that an animal product-based country, it's expensive, so bad for people's health, so bad for communities, so bad for the environment. So, like there's so many reasons that I feel like, and it's in so many people's self-interest to change eventually, not even to make the wholesale change that we're advocating, but even just like, a 50% change. Like when I, I did a Q&A up here with my friend Mian Park when we put out the book Gristle, and the question when we did our book tour that we got over and over again was about the economics of meat. People would say like, well, it's easy for you guys to be vegan because you can afford it, but you know, what about, what do you say to the people who can't afford to be vegan? I'm like, stop subsidizing animal products. That would like, if, if magically, animal product subsidies ended tomorrow, the United States would become a vegan country. Like if people had, like if, go, if a family of four going to McDonald's without subsidies would cost about $80. You know, a gallon of milk would cost about $20. And like, if let, so we're saying let animal products actually cost what they cost and the world is gonna become a very different place. Do you feel like there's any political movement towards that? Or Absolutely the, not. Do you have any friends in Congress or the Senate who, are working towards that kind of thing? Cory Booker. Yeah. Uh, Cory Booker, a, a vegan Football senator, player. Yeah. Football player and senator from New Jersey. Yeah. Trying to do some things there, but the political process is such a difficult situation. If you can get elected as mayor of Newark as a vegan, you can... It's pretty neat to see. Yeah. But I think where the real change is ultimately going to happen is in the marketplace. And I think that the way the subsidies are now, it does enable this wasteful, harmful, abusive system. And it, that is very frustrating because, you know, people, taxpayers are enabling this, the squandering of resources like water, for example. You know, agriculture gets water at a fraction of the market value. And now they're starting to sell it to cities. So what, why should they be entitled to that kind of benefit? when they've caused so much harm. You know, I've seen at slaughterhouses sometimes in California, they've used like fire hoses to herd animals. And I think one of the reasons they have done this has been to sort of maintain their water allotment. So if they use it, they keep getting it. And they're getting it at a fraction of the value, of the market value. So if the real market was allowed to function and if consumers were allowed to make informed choices um, that were in their interests and if People became, and people are becoming more aware, but, um, but again, hamburgers are artificially cheap and other animal foods are artificially cheap. If the real market was allowed to function, I think we would see a massive shift. And I feel like people are becoming so much better educated. You know, for example, Governor Brown a few days ago started this Save Water initiative where he said he wanted consumers to reduce their water use by 25%. It's really noble but he didn't mention agriculture. And the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times all held him accountable and said, what about agriculture? And he said, no, we don't wanna talk about agriculture. And then people drilled deeper and they started talking about animal agriculture. You know, and how, what an egregious, like does everyone here know how much water is involved to create a pound of beef? Well, okay, so a pound of broccoli requires about 80 gallons of water. Um, a pound of soybeans, about 200 gallons of water. All totaled, a pound of beef requires 10,000 gallons of water. Why, does, why do we have livestock in California? So it's 
basically having access to this information and effectively presenting it to people and to legislators, I think that's what's going to change the economics. Like when people realize how much money is spent subsidizing animal production, I think eventually politicians will have to respond to that. At least that's my naive, vaguely well, ill-informed nice hope. hope. You know, it possible. It's possible. It's business. I mean, the government is kind of business, and you have industries that have invested for decades. They've, you know you know, invested in politicians who are doing what those industries would like them to do. And, um, and you know, the Agriculture Committee supports all these irresponsible practices. And, but the reason these industries are so powerful is because consumers are buying their stuff, voting with our dollars, enabling and empowering that industry then to invest in the politicians who then maintain the status quo. And you know, politics are generally um, sort of conservative and want to maintain the status quo. So the marketplace, though, but there, there are disruptors, there are new businesses, vegan businesses, uh, places like Hampton Creek, which is a company up in the Bay Area that's come up with this stuff, it's amazing. And, and their philosophy is to compete head-to-head -head in the marketplace to produce plant-based alternatives to animal foods like mayonnaise. And they have a product called Just Mayo uh, Hellman's didn't like it, so they sued him. And then after Hellman's got a ton of bad press, Hellman said, okay, well, we'll stop. And they dropped the suit. So there's these kinds of businesses that are now starting to compete. And I think that's another thing that is starting to happen that will drive change. And then, of course, then you have vegan mayo that's much more convenient. Consumers buy it, building and voting with their dollars for that type of a food system instead of what has been the norm. Um, so one of your, the strategies that I think has been really effective uh, that the movement has taken on was like Proposition 2 here in California. It's, it's kind of what the, the pro-pot people did. I interviewed them back in 2000, and they were very clear about their strategy, which was to get people interested in old ladies with glaucoma and cancer, give them medical marijuana, everyone will see that marijuana is fine, and legalize marijuana. And that's kind of what happened. Well, you know, with Proposition 2, that was a measure to ban veal crates, gestation crates, and battery cages. These are real intense confinement systems where animals can't even turn around or stretch their limbs. So we framed it so basically. And, you know, California voters voted to ban those systems in 2008. And what it did, I think, actually even more Im importantly than giving animals a little bit more space was it got people thinking and discussing these issues and I was actually speaking to a group of industry folks and I was on a panel and I was the vegan industry and there were folks being meat industry or to meat industry okay. totally meat like the pork producers council type people and then there's an industry communications guy and me and him are kind of going back and forth and and I just make the case like Moby was saying about just how inefficient animal agriculture is and I always try to go in and find common ground say things like we support farmers farmers are important they feed us and that's really critical but the question is how can farmers feed us the best and is it animal agriculture or plant agriculture and you talk about the science and says it's plant agriculture um, but when I was on this panel with this guy, he brought up Proposition 2 that only gave animals a little bit more space. And he said, what these vegans are doing is really smart. They're only saying give animals more space. But what it's doing is it's reducing meat consumption. Because I think what it is is people then start thinking about it. And, you know, the industry doesn't want us to think about this stuff. They're actually trying to pass these ag gag laws to make it more difficult to get undercover footage to show what is happening. And if this is an industry that is so horrendous they don't want people seeing what's happening, that obviously says something. So, um, so, the, so when people start thinking about this stuff and start making more informed, thoughtful, mindful choices, shift is happening. And then the convenience factor, that is, I think, now what has to start increasing. And so new restaurants and, and like, like Moby's and Silver Lake is a great example of making this accessible and easy. And that's happening in a big way, I think. And how do you get people who are meat eaters to come to your restaurant? Well, so the, the story behind the restaurant that I'm hopefully opening, um, <laughs> my friend Anne was a classically trained chef. Uh, she helped open Waverly Inn and Gemma in New York. Um, these are meat-heavy restaurants. And she had a show on the Food Network and she was doing a food demo in Indiana. And she looked at the audience, and everyone in the audience was dangerously obese. 
And she suddenly realized like, oh my God, my food is killing people. And she became a vegan and lost 80 pounds. And this is her first vegan restaurant. Wow. Yeah, we were talking. We were talking with a chef today who had a similar comment. Was it Anthony Batali or the, the the one chef we talked yeah. to mentioned something about Anthony Batali having a Mario Batali? Yeah, Mario. Mario Batali one time pulled me aside in confidence, and he was like, "I feel so bad." He's like, "My food is hurting people," but that's what himself. They, yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah. "But yeah. that's what they want." Like you know, um, now the chef I forget his name, but he's an Italian chef, and he was like, "I." Don't, don't, you guys, I mean, I still make meat, but like half my menu is vegan and I really want to have like whole foods and ethically sourced meat. And I was like, that's kind of a contradiction in terms, but, you know, but still like the consciousness has changed. We would never have had that conversation 20 years ago. So true. So that's where it's very exciting and encouraging to see that the conversation is happening. And now there needs to be sort of the infrastructure in the food businesses to kind of support and enable this kind of shift. And unfortunately, again, we have government subsidies that are enabling a completely different, abusive, wasteful system. But when we run out of water, we're gonna not have a choice. And when we run out of, you know, the scarce resources that this industry squanders, and, and you know, the healthcare costs and the suffering and the, the misery that it causes, you know, that, as that becomes more I think there's going to be stronger and stronger motivations to change. And, and when do you expect and hope that that will happen? I get asked that all the time. I know it's, but really hard to say. I mean, I think we are. It's it, it's really things are happening big time now. You know, and meat consumption has started going down in the U.S. And so I think we're at the beginning stage of what could potentially be a massive move. And do you feel that movement happening just here in California, or do you feel it when you go around the country and talk to people? Well, I, th <laughs> I think it's happening most in places like California, New York, and urban centers. Um, but it is happening in places like Omaha, Nebraska. I went into this place called New York Poultry, is that the name of the restaurant? They had vegan Philly cheesesteaks there. Who would have thought that? You know, So there are pockets all over, and there are people who have had heart disease and have learned that by eating better, they can reverse it. There's a cardiologist, for example, that I've met a couple times in Racine, Wisconsin, who saw forks over knives about five years ago, and he is now working with his patients to reverse heart disease with plant foods. And there are doctors all over the country like that. And, and when you have a, a citizen who has had a problem and starts changing the way they eat and they get healthier and people see that, it has a big effect. So I think there's this grassroots wellness movement happening in a lot of places. So um, it just makes sense when you think about it. Like your doctor thinks your good skin is from being vegan, right? So I'm an inbred wasp from Connecticut and I've never worn sunblock ever. And I got sunburned lots of times growing up and I was a crazy alcoholic for a long time, going out in the sun, drinking, whatever. And I went to a dermatologist for the first time about two years ago. Super fancy guy in Beverly Hills with one of those guns, like a microscope gun, and he looked at everything. And I thought like, you know what? My ancestors are Scottish and Irish. I'm gonna be covered in pre-melanomas. And at the end of it, he said, no, you're fine. And I was like, that's not possible. Like, I've never worn sunblock and I'm an inbred wasp from Connecticut. And he's like, no, you're fine, you're vegan. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, I only see this with my vegan clients. And of course, vegans can get melanoma, but because of the antioxidants and the fiber, we're protected from a lot of stuff that the general public isn't. And this stuff works, you know, instead of getting drugs, which is what doctors generally do, they you know, say, they, you know, I, I hadn't been to a doctor for a long time, and about maybe five, seven years ago, I went to see a doctor thinking, well, I should get things checked out. And he said, is there any heart disease in the family? So I said, well, my grandfather died of a heart attack. My father had a heart attack. And without taking any blood tests or anything like that, he said, well, I might want to put you on heart medication. It was like, whoa. You know, I mean, that is and As you're crazy. sitting there and there's like a picture of him on a sailboat in the Caribbean with the guy from the heart medication lobby, you know, like. Or, or like, the, the hot woman coming in with the portfolio of heart yeah. medication. 
I mean, that is the in, that's sort of the infrastructure in place. You know, these medical, you know, continuing education programs are oftentimes sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. And they get you coming and going. I mean, the majority of the antibiotics used in the U.S. are fed to farm animals. And then we eat the animals, we have heart disease, and then we take them on this other side. So this is an industry making a ton of money on this messed up food system. So how do you get the medical establishment? And the, you were telling me the veterinarian establishment is not altogether vegan either. How do oh, you no. get them into Well, That's weird to me. I thought that they're, because they're the, the animal lovers. Well, they're evolving, but you know, again, here you have institutions and mechanisms to maintain the status quo. I uh, went to Cornell and took some animal science classes, and in those classes, you saw young students who were animal people who were wanted to be veterinarians and they were desensitized. There was this one class I remember where they were showing us routine procedures on baby piglets. And so we went into the pig barn where there were a couple mother pigs with babies in these farrowing crates. And this teacher was picked up a baby piglet and showed us tail docking. He just cut off the tail without any painkillers, ear notching, cutting chunks of skin out of the ears, no painkillers. The pigs were screaming, bleeding, and the young students looking at this were aghast. They were like, they were not happy with it and, and empathized with the animals and felt that this was not a good thing. And then the teacher said, now who wants to try it? And everybody looked down, nobody wanted to do it. But then eventually one of the young students stepped forward and did this, and then a second one did it. And then the initial resistance started draining away and it was becoming normal. And so in vet school, this happens. Um, and in the medical profession, things are, well, that's just how it's done. And instead of saying, well, wait a second, that doesn't seem right, it doesn't feel right, is there maybe another way? And you know, when you have so much momentum and machinery pushing one direction, pushing against it can be tough. And so, but there are doctors now, and they're getting results with people eating plant foods instead of animal foods. Okay, you have all these great ways in to convince people, whether it's their health or the environment or ethics. Zoonotic disease is a big one. Which one? Zoonotic disease. What's... Um, disease that has its origin in animal populations, like oh. smallpox, the common cold, Ebola, SARS, avian bird flu. Um, these are all diseases that started in animal populations. And it's just, it's becoming epidemic. And they get passed on through eating meat, yeah. through or having farming. Con or, or having contact with right. animal populations, yeah. Okay, so you have all these great ways in. Have you been able to convince the people closest in your life uh, who, you know, your it's, family? It's your... that idea of figuring out how do you convince. Like at first, when I became a vegan, I thought, oh, I'm making this choice for super compassionate, rational reasons. I just assumed other people would agree with me. And when they didn't, I got frustrated, so I started yelling at them. And that didn't work. And then you kind of, the idea of like leading by example or not even leading, but just like providing an example, that sort of works, but it can be frustrating because you want the change to happen so much faster. You know, I think, you know, we are primarily emotional creatures as human beings. You know, we like to talk about being rational and we have reason and we can make rational choices, but you know, we are creatures of habit and we are emotional and we have attachments to things. And how we eat, you know, it's been said forever, you are what you eat. And you know we are products of culture. And if you change, then it's it may feel like you're rejecting something or someone. And so there's a lot of emotional elements to our food choices. Um, and just and for me, I just try to see things as they are. And you know, and this is where again get to the rational, looking at on this side eating animals, what it means. And, and the benefits of not. But some of these emotional attachments, I think, present challenges. And then convenience and habits and fear. I think fear is one of the big ones. People are afraid of change. People do a certain thing because they know it. It's familiar. It's comfortable. Getting out of that is scary sometimes. And, and people have been barraged with, you need meat for protein. If you don't eat meat, you're a wimp. You know, these kind of crazy ideas, and there's something in us that I think creates fear and resistance to change. And um, so I think that how is the way to do it? One of the 
ways is just make it so darn convenient. You know, you talk about all these high-minded ideals, but having it in front of you is probably the way we ultimately create the change. My concern stems from the fact of supply and demand. As demand for meat and dairy abroad, like you said, in China, grows, even as demand in the U.S. may decrease, won't profiteers send hapless animals, including horses, this woman, this person loves horses, or to other countries, thereby increasing the suffering of animals? Uh, the cost, it's, it's a cost issue. Um, without subsidies, I mean, with subsidies, that export is viable. Without subsidies, it just isn't. You know, like the cost involved in raising a cow or raising a horse or raising something and then shipping it across the world, if you remove subsidies, it's not in anyone's financial interest to do that. So that's, I really think like as, as a movement, that's sort of one of our goals is like, how can we decrease subsidies to animal production? Yeah, and around the world, I mean, you, know, you can't control others, you can only control yourself, you know, and in the U.S. we have for many years been acting in a way that's pretty irresponsible when it comes to food, and for us to go to China and say, you guys shouldn't do that, when we've been doing it for decades, is a little bit, you know, inconsistent. So I think we need to set a better example here, and also work internationally to expose the harm this industry causes, but ultimately it might just be resources, you know, and, and, and when we start running out of water, and fossil fuels and clean air and land, um, then we're not gonna have a choice. All right, I am a vegan. My cat is not. <laughs> Other animals have to die so he can live. How do we reconcile this? I struggle with this. This is one of my issues, because um, I love animal rescue organizations, um, but like, I hate to say this, but like, you save a dog, you save a cat, that's condemning lots of other animals to die. I, whenever I've had pets, or not, when I've had companion animals, they've been vegan. It is possible to have vegan cats. They can be quite healthy. It just, it takes little effort, but I would say, I mean, all I'm gonna say is for myself, I'm so committed to animal welfare and veganism that I couldn't possibly in good conscience serve animal products to a companion animal. And there are lots of ways to get around that. So what, you give them vegan meals and they like are sad for a little while or what happens? <laughs> the only cat, dogs it's easy because they're omnivores. Um, cats it's trickier because they're true carnivores. Like if you look at their gastrointestinal system. Um, the big thing with cats is the amino acid taurine. You know, they need taurine which it's hard to get in a vegan diet, so you have to put like supplements. There used to be a supplement called Veggie Cat. I don't know if it still exists. But it is possible, having at the very least like primarily vegan vegetarian cats. But like cats, it's super tricky because do you know how many birds, moles, mice, et cetera, cats kill every year? It's in like in the 50 to 100 billion. Like cats are little genocide. Oh, yeah, monsters. I saw that little. You know, like, someone had a video on their cat. Like they attached them to them, and there was like carnage everywhere. Yeah, everything. And like, and I love cats. Don't get me wrong, but like, it's really hard to be like a lover of animals and let let your cat go out and kill innocent creatures. Do you talk to your cat about this? What's that? <laughs> I just keep it in a metal cage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I like this question. What would you recommend stocking up on to make recipes from the book? Like, what are like five things you should, oh, I should have in Go my- Go to Costco and get gallon drums of chili powder. <laughs> I mean, seasonal stuff is, you know, one of the suggestions in the book. And you can also get things, you know, cheaper in season because you have these bumper crops, you have all the berries at a certain time and maybe freeze them to use them later. So that's a, actually affordable. It's supporting local, sustainable farming in many ways. Um, beans are another really good thing to have. Beans are a very healthy food. Um, and uh, whole grains are also really wonderful. I mean, a lot of people you know, have oatmeal, for example, for breakfast. So that's a, a, a great staple. Those are a few. What are like two or three things you have in your house that I don't have in my house that I should? Well, you probably have coffee, right? I do. Yeah, well, so we got that. Um, Non-dairy milks. I mean, that is so easy now. And making almond milk, you can make almond milk in about five seconds. It's super complicated. You take almonds, 
and water, you put it in a blender, and that's almond milk. Oh, it's not soaked. <laughs> I thought it was kind of just... And then you strain it through like a strainer, right. and you have like beautiful, clean, wonderful... I will do milk. that tonight. And it's like, it's so much better than any of that crap in a box. It's not good, the crap in the box. No, it, it, yeah. it's, like, it's like nail polish remover, but a little worse. I'm going to make almond milk tonight. And you know, maybe even like fruit, you know, having like apples and oranges. If you get stuff and you have it in your kitchen, you're more likely to eat it. Yeah. You know, and so whole plant foods just like that are, are very good to have around. Because um, if you, you know, get candy and cookies and you put that in the kitchen, you're going to eat it. And that's... All right, know, this, not ideal. this question speaks to me too. If many of the U.S. meat eaters transition to a fish seafood diet, wouldn't that be commendable? Well, hey, hey, judgy. <laughs> this is, have you not listened to Gene? It's just reading it's a like question. The word, pay attention. It's not editorializing. Um, okay, wouldn't that be commendable first step towards a vegan diet? Well, well any step away from eating animals is positive. You know, but when some animals are substituted for other animals, then it's not so positive. And the fish industry is pretty horrible. Um, you know, the, the oceans have been overfished. You have wild populations that have been decimated. I remember reading something from Feedstuffs, which is like the Wall Street Journal of Agribusiness, talking about wild fish populations. You know, when there's a fad for a particular kind of fish, that species is gone, right. and there's a fad for another one, it's gone. So agribusiness says, well, this creates a great opportunity for aquaculture, where they can now raise animals in these basic fish factories. And, and it's actually very in resource intensive. Oftentimes, you have wild fish that are caught in bycatch um, that is then fed to these factory farmed fish. So it's also an inherently inefficient system when you're raising animals for food, because you need to feed them a lot to get you know, you need to feed them like 10 times as much to get one pound of the f meat. But if you ate the plants directly, you could uh, eat a lot more. So fish farming is going factory farming, and it's ugly. And you have fish crowded in fecally rich water environments. Not a pretty sight. That's what they write in the Whole Foods thing on the bottom. Yeah. Fecally, rich. Fecally, fecally rich. Fecally rich environments. But, but you did give me an idea. Do you know... Because like the fish world, they're really good at renaming things. Like, is everyone here familiar with the Patagonian toothfish? So the Patagonian toothfish, that sounds disgusting. You don't want to eat Patagonian toothfish, right? The fish mob renamed it Chilean sea bass. And it became a very popular fish among people who eat it. So we need to rename some of our terrible sounding foods. Like tofu. It's time to rename tofu. Like, <laughs> maybe we call it like... Happy meat. <laughs> yeah, like Santa Barbara bean love. <laughs> no, that sounds, that sounds like the name of like a child on a cult. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're close though. Bean is good. Um, we'll, we'll get there. Um, cruelty free is not only about your diet, but also about what you wear. What is the best way someone can become aware of their fashion and knowing that an animal wasn't harmed in the making of it? Hey, what's going on down there? Yeah, that's, that's not animal. It is probably plastic petroleum, so it's not perfect. The, but the it's world not of animal. vegan shoes and whatever, like I remember when I first became a vegan trying to find vegan shoes, and it basically consisted of like wrapping your feet in duct tape. <laughs> and now, like you go to Moo Shoes or some of these places, and like it's, it's, it's great. Yeah, like that's a choice I did not make mindfully at all. Do you know what I mean? Like when I bought my car, I purposely got the fake, not leather really? interior. Did you? The, the, the bar for me is pretty low, isn't it? <laughs> that's a good thing. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people that, you know, when they get a car, they say, I don't want leather. Yeah, so it's, a actually... lot, it's a lot of leather to put in your car for no reason, right? Yeah, and, and so yeah. you made that, that point. Yeah, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so one I'm of us, one of us, one of us. He's in the us. tribe, he's in the tribe. I will be only half stoned when I leave this place. <laughs> Um, Pebbled. But, but like shoes, I don't, I don't want leather shoes. I don't know how this happened. I just bought shoes and didn't think about it. But you know, each of us can do a little better. You know, that's right. the thing. And even as a vegan, I've been a vegan a long time, but I was also not eating the greatest healthy food. You know, so I'm trying to make more of an effort now to eat greens and green smoothies and whole plant foods. And you know, so that's, for me, it, was, it started as ethics and has evolved beyond to more health, social justice, environment, all of those things 
Do really you find important. that you can't go to some social events, like your friends are inviting you out to dinner, and you're like, oh, I can't go to that place, or? I just go, and like if I know that I can't eat, I either eat beforehand, or just like fast and judge. <laughs> like just like, <laughs> just like sit in the corner and scowl at people. But you, you just go and don't eat. Sometimes, I mean, yeah. there, there are places where I'm just not comfortable, like, and, one th like it's sometimes nice they're like oh we can make you something vegan i'm like no just forget it you know like i'm i'm perfectly happy to not eat and just like hang out or like take some like napkins and ice and make a little smoothie <laughs> <laughs> that's the saddest thing i've ever heard <laughs> uh, all right i'm going to ask one last question um, i like this one uh, Jean, but, but both of you, you have witnessed the horrors of factory farming firsthand. How do you respond to people who think that grass-fed beef is humane? Well, oh, I, picked a, I picked a good one. Uh, I mean, killing is killing, and the word humane and slaughter don't fit very well together, you know? And if we can live well without causing harm, why wouldn't we? Now, with awareness about factory farming and opposition to the cruelty of it, there is a move to push this idea that animals can be raised humanely, they can be out to graze and so on. Usually those labels sound a lot better than they are. And you have animals still that are essentially in, raised in industrial type situations and then it's sold as humane or free range or cage free. So the labels are not very accurate and they're very misleading to most You can feel like I was buying, I am buying cage free eggs and feeling good about myself until my friend from PETA told me to just don't it's, it's, it's less bad, but it's still bad. And, and a lot of that is, could still be considered factory farmed, I would say. Um, so if we can live without doing that, why wouldn't we? You know, it's come, keep coming back to that. And the fact that there's this acknowledgement, though, that these are animals that have feelings that should be treated better, should be treated with respect, and should be treated with compassion, is a sentiment that is important and one that we fully support. And what does that sentiment mean then? If an animal should be treated with respect and compassion, does that mean we should still kill them and eat them? <laughs> so that's, you know, those things are not exactly aligned. So it's the beginning, I think, of a process and an awareness and a recognition that these other creatures have, deserve something better. And, and, and that, I think, ultimately leads to the logical end, which is that we shouldn't harm them unnecessarily. Well, I want to thank uh, both of you for teaching me and letting me sit here and annoy you with my questions. I want to thank all the meat eaters in the audience who had the guts to show up here tonight. Uh, and thank you for your book. I, the recipes are really helping me. It's been great. No, well, well, thank you for moderating this. Thank you, Moby, for being here. Thank you all for being here. And, and Gene's uh, going to sign some books after. <laughs> We've learned today about the power of YouTube videos yeah. and to be very careful with Moby's recipe in the book. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Thank you.